Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, feel free to hop into Luke 2. That's where we're going to be today. Uh, I'm going to camp out there for the most part uh, throughout my message today. Uh, if you've got an iPad, iPhone, you're welcome to use it. Uh, here out in the country, you mostly have to use your own data because our church internet's really slow. I don't know if you have internet out here, but it's really slow, so you're better to rely on the your data plan if you've got that on your phone. Otherwise, there are Bibles in the pew in front of you. If for some reason you don't own a Bible and you're here today, let me know. I'd love to get you a Bible that you could take home. I've got plenty. I'll give you one so you can take it and have it and learn and grow um, wherever you might go. But we're going to camp out in Luke 2, like I said. You know, as I, we talked about this some, but as I look at Advent, as we work our way through Advent season, every year it seems it's easy to get you know, caught up in the noise, caught up in the hubbub. There's just so many distractions in the world. And, and we talk about this, but it, it's something we just have to constantly remind ourselves as Christ followers because so quickly our, our focus can get off what is the true meaning of the season. And, and when that happens, we begin to lose out on some of the, the, the beauty, some of the, the profound realities that come for us to study and learn and grow in uh, during this season. And the truth of the matter is, we are all a bit prone to becoming numb to this time of year, aren't we, right? We become numb to the spiritual truths that come at Christmas, either because we've heard them, you know, and many of you, like me, probably grew up in the church, so I've gone to the church for 40x number of years, and for 40x number of years, only a few passages of the Bible are used, right, for Christmas, every year. And so every year for 40 some years, I've heard the same stories over and over and over again. And what that can kind of do to you, if you're not careful, you get a little inoculated against the beauty, the glory, the magnificence of the Christmas story. Uh, So we have to be a little bit careful as followers of Christ because of that. And even if you're not a Christian, we grew up, at least here in Minnesota, in a culture that's enculturated um, to telling these stories. And so even if you're not a Christian, you've probably heard these stories quite a bit over your lifetime. And so we just have to be careful that we pause, that we come before it, ready for the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and our lives, to just open our eyes anew, to see the stories there in Scripture. So as I said, I am going to read a very familiar passage. I've got Luke 2. You've heard this before, I bet. The kids in the video that we started the service with were hitting passages of it. And this passage is concerning the angel of God who heralds to the shepherds in the field at night, right? They're out shepherding their flock. And it comes and tells them about the coming Messiah. So we're going to be in Luke 2, 8, and we'll work our way down to verse 20 today. And it says, In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So ends the reading of God's word. Now right out of the gates here, the story, if you're following it, it begins to track away a little bit from what you might think of as normal. And you may not be familiar with this guy, but I, I highly recommend him. If you're looking for some books to read, if you've got like some Amazon cash this Christmas, Tim Keller, he's a pastor at, Reform Pres- at a Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Manhattan. And Tim Keller is probably one of the smartest guys on the planet. Amazing, amazingly smart and incredibly articulate. And and one of the things he talks about is he's talking about this passage. He talks about this thing called kingdom economics. That's what he uses, that phrase of kingdom economics to explain this. And he talks about how the economy of God's kingdom is upside down. It's not the economy that we operate in, in the day-to-day, in the normal, where we see where power and wealth are, are worthy and admirable, Right? No, God would say, no, 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 no. God says, 
Meekness, right? Lowliness in kingdom economics is the thing to be valued. Humility over swagger is to be valued. That is kingdom economics. Those who were told very first of the good news of the coming of Jesus Christ were the shepherds, folks. Not the priests, not the rich people, not the rulers. And the heralding of the kingdom of God, the coming of Jesus Christ, didn't go to the people who tithed like, you know, 12%, right? They didn't go to the big givers first, right? Not even the 10 percenters, no. That's not who the angel of the Lord went to. The heralding of the good news of the coming of Jesus. See, it didn't, it didn't fall on those who were the morally upright people of the time. It didn't fall on the, the best rule followers of the time of Jesus. But instead, the first ones to hear that the Messiah had come, they were broken. They were the hopeless. They were the helpless. It comes to shepherds. Now my guess is, since we're Minnesotans, that you probably don't know any shepherds, right? Anybody know a shepherd? Yeah? I mean, you might know somebody in Montana who's a shepherd, right? Um, I, 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 I grew up in South Dakota and far north of where Kevin lives, like in the northwest corner of South Dakota, there is more sheep than you can imagine, right? You ever been up there, Kevin? Yeah, just, just sheep everywhere. Like, you, I, I drove from Kildare, North Dakota, down to New Mexico and cut through that part of the country one day. And as I was driving, I'm not kidding, for hours, it was fields of flocks of sheep. And like once, maybe an hour, would another car pass me. It's that unpopulated out there. And it's hard to fathom, but there are actual shepherds of sorts, not like biblical shepherds, but shepherds that live out there. So there's a chance you might know a shepherd, but most of us, we never have even met a shepherd, right? Well, the thing you need to know about biblical shepherds is about the time of Jesus, anyhow. These first century shepherds were so poorly thought of that they were not allowed to come to court and give testimony in a court of law because nobody trusted them. Their, their opinions and, and their, what they say was never to be trusted because they were shepherds. They were considered to be liars. They were considered to be thieves. And they were so unclean morally and so morally reprehensible that no judge would ever take their testimony as truth. And now on top of that, they were fundamentally rejected by their brothers and sisters who were Jews. They were rejected because they were believed to be outside of the covenant promises of God. The reason for that being is the nature of what they did. Because you see, when you work with animals day in and day out, 24-7, 365, when you sleep with sheep, when you help birth the little lambs, when you're with them all day, every day, helping them from getting stuck, finding them when they get lost, walking them from field to field, taking them down to get water, if you worked with animals, you know what I'm talking about. They get you a little dirty when you work with them all day, right? Okay, now imagine this. They're out in the fields, hard-working guys. They don't have showers, right? They don't have a place at the end of the day that they can go wash up, that they can go clean up, that they can go do their purification to be ritually, ceremonially clean. So day after day, week after week, they get dirty. And if you know shepherds, these weren't the rich guys of the time, right? The people who had the money were the ones who owned the flocks, not the people who cared for the flocks. And so these guys had like one outfit. That's what they owned. Everything they owned, they had to be able to carry with them because they had to follow the sheep wherever they were going to go or lead the sheep where they were going to go, depending on the day. And so when that's the case, you get dirty, you get filthy. If you ever, I, I've been up close to a, 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 a sheep. If you've not been up close to a sheep, they're funky. Okay? Not, not quite as funky as a goat, 
but a different kind of funky because they got all that wool, right? And, and you ever smelled lanolin? Some of you maybe used that in leathers or other things. Lanolin itself has kind of a funky smell. That, that's what the sheep uses in its wool. It creates it naturally. And as that gets out into the wool and it stays there for long periods of time, it smells a little bit weird. So these shepherds, they're, they're, they're covered in filth. They're working with animals that make a mess, that do what animals do. Their clothes get it built up on them. It kind of gets into their skin. And so all the other people in their, in their society, so to speak, rejected them because they were, they were ceremonially unclean. And, and what that meant, and this is a big deal, folks, it meant they could not go to the temple to make atonement for their sins. It wasn't like their boss said, oh yeah, just guys, take the week off and get yourself ceremonial clean. That way you can go into Jerusalem the next week. You know, so now I have two weeks off. Now you can go into Jerusalem finally and go make some sacrifices because, you know, you're sinners and you need to do that, right? They didn't have shepherd unions back in those days. They didn't have things to make that happen. And so these guys were ceremonially unclean. They were unwanted by society. And yet, when it comes to sharing the good news, when it comes to sharing the, the hope of all the people of God, God chooses not to come to the, to the rich, the wealthy, the ruler, the morally upright. But rather, he goes to the, the broken, the hopeless, the helpless, the outcast, the outsider. You see, that is kingdom economics. And as we look at that, we need to marvel at that because it's so different than what the world might have us think. And here's what I mean by marvel. What I've found often to be true is that people who are not Christians, they tend to feel a lot of animosity towards God. Because, and, and I was there once upon a time, before I became a Christian. I became a Christian as an adult. And, and, and I remember before I came to Christ that I really thought that God was like this, you know, looking over my shoulder, waiting for me to screw up, waiting for me to do something wrong, waiting for me to sin, waiting for me to be bad so he could catch me and he could punish me, right? That was kind of my image of God, that God was out to get me. And if God's already out to get me, if God is angry at me, if God doesn't love me, well then why should I care about God anyhow, right? That's kind of how I felt. So I thought God hated me. I might as well hate him back in return. And so people who aren't Christians kind of tend to, to feel that way. I, I've experienced this as I've talked with them over the years as being a pastor. And there's this animosity, this underlying anger in their hearts towards God because they, they, they feel kind of like God has maybe written them off a little bit. And yet, the good news that God sent the angels and he sent them to the shepherds. The other mistake that we find in kingdom economics is that Christians over time, we tend to isolate ourselves somewhat, right? We sometimes work ourselves into a Christian bubble. Maybe this is you. And, and over time, we can, if we're not careful, surround ourselves only with people who think like we think and live like we live and believe like we believe and behave like we behave and we end up isolating ourselves from the rest of the world living in this little insulated bubble where sinners can't enter in, right? But there's a problem. You're inside of that bubble. Sin has already entered in, right? Right? The irony of the idea that we might insulate ourselves from the brokenness of the world is we're the brokenness of the world. Anybody here not sinned recently? Right? And so the idea that we could create this bubble for ourselves, it, it, it's not the kingdom economics that God would have us have. We can't look around and say, oh, those are the sinners. No. The sinners are we. We all battle with our flesh. We all battle with sin. And if you don't believe that to be true, you're just, the Bible says very clearly, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. Right? If you grew up Lutheran, you said that every week in church. I did. 
It didn't mean anything to me because I wasn't a Christian yet, but still, I heard it. And what we see here is God sending these angels and the heavenly hosts to the shepherds is actually a pattern of how Christ is going to go about doing his ministry. For example, we see this in Mark 2.15. And it says this, And he, Jesus, reclined at the table in his house among the tax collectors and the sinners who were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he, Jesus, was eating with sinners and with tax collectors, they said, why does he, what is Jesus doing? Why does, why does Jesus hang out with these people, right? Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick are the ones who need me. He says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, one of the patterns that we see in Jesus' life, in fact, probably the most common accusation that's made against Christ, is that he was a friend of sinners, right? He regularly, intentionally spent time. He sat down and ate meals with them. Now, eating a meal with somebody is a big deal in this culture. When you sit down, when you have a meal, when you break bread with somebody, this is a lengthy event. This is not something to take lightly. This isn't just running over to Taco Bell and grabbing, you know, a taco gut bomb and getting some heartburn and heading home. This is a big deal. When you accept an invitation to go to somebody's home and have a meal, you are their guest. They are required by, by relational code to treat you in a specific manner and you in return them. And, and there's a whole process that goes with that. And you're going to be there for a while and you're going to eat together and you're going to share stories together. You're going to share a little bit of your life together. There's going to be a little bit of a mending of the fabrics of your two streams of life bringing you together. It's an intimate experience to go and have a meal with somebody else in this culture. And they're saying Jesus is, he's going and, and having this deeper relationship with sinners with tax collectors the lowest of the low the grossest of the gross what's he doing the Pharisees and the scribes the people of the day that were you know the morally upright people the elite spiritual bigwigs right the kind of you know if, if you were looking if you had a daughter and you wanted her to date somebody you were trying to find a Pharisee or a scribe date Date that guy, right? You didn't want your daughter dating a tax collector. Date the Pharisee. But yet, Jesus, he goes over to the tax collector's house, right? That Jesus would go to Zacchaeus' house was a scandal in this culture. That he hung out with sinners was constantly murmured by those who were opposing Jesus. Constantly talked behind his back, hey, did you see who Jesus just hung out with? And not only did he see them, but he gave them standing and value. He treated them as worthy. Now within that though, within that we see Jesus being very serious about sin. Very serious about salvation. Serious about holiness. Serious about repentance. Yet, able to walk that fine line of being friends with sinners. Jesus is the friend of sinners. But he carries himself not as a man who wants to be accepted by the in crowd, by the cool crowd, by the, the rich, wealthy, powerful elite. But instead he carries himself as one who is confident in the truth of God's word. One who comes able to love, able to serve, able to engage and able to woo the hearts of men and women away from what is false towards what is true. That's why we need to marvel at this. It's special. It's different. It's amazing. And here's what I'm trying to get you to see. And if for some reason you're not a Christian and you're here, I want you to hear this. I want to point out that the, the coming of Christ is about God's friendship towards you. 
See, I didn't understand that before I was a Christian. Like I said, I thought God was out to get me. I didn't understand that God had sent his son, Jesus, to reconcile with me. That he'd gone out of his way for me. When God came into the earth to be Emmanuel, God with us, flesh, a baby born in a manger. He didn't send Jesus to bring us commandments 11, 12, 13, 14, you know, all the way through 20. That's not what happened. God sends Jesus and he's wrapped in swaddling clothes. If you were planning a plan to save the world, how would you do it? Would you pick an infant? It's not the way I would. Good thing I'm not God, apparently. But the first thing that comes to mind, if I'm trying to save the world, isn't, well, let's send a Jesus baby, plop him down in a manger, have him surrounded by some smelly sheep herders, to a young, unwed mother and father who happen to be traveling. They're on the road, right? Now, if I'm writing the story, I'm not writing it like that. But then again, I'm not God. We read this in John 3.17. Now, I, I know John 3.16, it gets all the press, right? John 3.16, you watch the football game, somebody will hold up a placard in the end zone, right? John 3.16, while somebody kicks a field goal. John 3.16 is a great verse. But John 3.17 is, folks, where it's really at. John 3.17 says this, that Christ has come into the world not to condemn the world, but rather to save the world from condemnation. Jesus is the friend of sinners. And for us as Christ followers, that means we need to be lights into our world. It means that we don't erect walls around us to protect us from the world. It means that we don't consider ourselves as better than anyone else. But rather, as Christians, we know how fortunate we are to be rescued, to be redeemed, and now to be an agent of reconciliation. And if you're a Christian, that is your task. That is your responsibility. That is your, your calling to share this good news that Jesus has come. Jesus has come to reconcile. Frankly, the shepherds give me a, a lot of hope. If you know my background, I come from a, a very blue-collar folk, right? My dad, my grandfathers, my aunts, my uncles, hard-working people, but very blue-collar. My friends, you know, I grew up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I grew up on the east side. I grew up downwind of John Morrell's. You ever been downwind of a meatpacking plant? We knew what they were doing. When my friends' dads came home, they smelled like John Morrell's because a lot of them worked at John Morrell's. That was the big employer when I was a kid. And so that's, you know, the, the schools I went to, blue collar, hardworking people. And if you know something about the shepherds, they're blue collar people too, and that's why the shepherds give me some hope. The shepherds, these were guys who were a little rough around the edges, right? A little bit earthy, a little bit wild. And here, at one of the apexes of all of the history of the world, God sends an angel to these roughnecks, right? And I'm guessing when the angel appears, these guys are sitting around the campfire. When they're sitting there, I'm guessing they're not sitting there having a Bible study that night, right? They hadn't gotten out the, tol, the, the Torah, the scroll, and what does Zephaniah say? Let us ponder, Right? Nah, I don't think that's how the, the shepherds went about their lives. And the first angel shows up, right? And it says, I have a message. First, don't be afraid. Now, why does he say that? Why does the angel say don't be afraid? I, it's a necessary thing, I believe, because if you're, if you're sitting around with a bunch of other crass rednecks around a campfire telling stories, you ever sat around campfire with a bunch of guys and listened to the stories we tell sometimes? They're not church appropriate often. Even if they're fishing tales, we lie. I don't fish, so I can let the truth out. But 
these guys are sitting around swapping stories, whatever it is they're doing. Probably cussing about the sheep that got away today that they had to chase down. Grumbling about the weather. Whatever it might be. And an angel of the Lord appears. Well, what's your first thought? My first thought, if an angel of the Lord appears and I'm sitting around with my buddies around a campfire, that's some smiting's about to happen, right? Some lightning bolts. He's going to get some folk, right? Zap. I heard what you said. Zap. I saw what you did. So the angel of the Lord appears and goes, hold on a second, gents. Don't be afraid. Actually, not only don't be afraid, but it conveys a sense of peace. Relax. Hold on a minute. I come to bring you good news. And then the holy choir strikes up the band, right? The sky explodes with the heavenly host saying, Glory to God in the highest. Right? The sky filled with angels singing. And when the angels show up and they say, glory to God in the highest, what is being declared there is that something is happening here. Something is happening now that is going to surpass anything you have ever seen anywhere ever before. Like the proclaiming of the glory of God saying, glory of God in the highest here, guys. This is the greatest thing. Everything else you have ever seen will pale in comparison. I mean, imagine this. The angels show up and say, glory to God. And it's like, it's like saying, Pastor Chris, do you like beef jerky? Oh, I do. In fact, I got two bags of beef jerky for Christmas this morning. Very timely for a sermon illustration. I love beef jerky, right? I even like Slim Jims. Like I have this road trip rule. It's not a good road trip unless I ate a Slim Jim. And it's just one of my things. I like Slim Jims and the heartburn that comes with them. But I like Slim Jims and I like beef jerky, right? But if you come to me and you say, well, you could have that beef jerky, you could have that Slim Jim, or how about this perfectly done, rosemary rubbed, crusted, herb, delicious piece of prime rib? I'm going prime rib every time, right? I, I, like, I like beef jerky, but I forgot all about that offer. I'm taking the prime rib each and every time. And these angels show up and they're like, everything you've ever seen before, it's like that cheap, you can't chew, get stuck in your teeth beef jerky, and now you're getting the best prime rib ever. That's what they're saying to these guys sitting around a campfire. Glory to God in the highest. And why glory to God? Because you see, God in sending of Jesus Christ into the world is sending him to make peace with mankind. Because you see in the Bible, the Bible is incredibly clear about this. We are broken. We're broken from birth. We are rebellious against our creator, each and every one of us. The Bible says there is not one who is righteous. All have fallen astray. And, and it not only says that, but the Bible says that any righteousness that we might forge on our own is a, is a false righteousness that's not acceptable to God. And the Bible says you and I, we're, we're in this broken, fractured relationship with our Creator. And it says that the wages of sin is death, and the punishment of sin is death. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. And here's what that means. It does mean physical death. That it does. But on top of that, it means this, this inability to, to experience the fullness of life in any given domain. Without reconciliation with God, fixing our sin problem is impossible on our own. Our lives will always be falling short. We'll always be lacking. Always be wanting more. When we're not reconciled with God, we're always going to want more money. We're always going to want more love. We're always going to want more power, more things, more stuff. And the problem is we always want more because the more, the thing that we are getting is never the thing that satisfies. It's never enough because those things are all always false gods. Those things can all be good. 
Don't, don't hear me say they're bad necessarily. But if our hope and trust is in those things, our hope and trust are in false gods because they're incomplete. And this is where the good news comes in. This is where Jesus comes in and he brings peace. This is why it matters so much. God makes peace with us where the wages of sin are death. The coming, the coming of Jesus Christ into this world is about the bringing of peace. It's about re- removing the hostility. It's about putting away and putting behind us the rebellion that we have against God. Jesus steps into the middle of our mess and he brings peace with his blood, blood shed on the cross, absorbing God's wrath for us and replacing it with God's pleasure, with God's joy, with God's peace, with his imputed righteousness that Jesus gives us all at salvation. If you're not a Christian, the Christian life is simply about surrendering our hearts to Jesus. It's a good and glad confession that, God, I've tried and I can't fix this life that I've broken. I've made a mess of things. And, Lord, I can't unmess it. So I give you my heart. I give you my life. I lay it down at your feet. When we come before Jesus as sinners, our cry is just, God, help me. I cannot help myself. Then it's about letting God reign in your heart. Letting God reign in your life as we cry out for that mercy, as we seek that forgiveness, as we then repent from our sins and begin to believe that God is a better God for you than you are, that God knows better for your life than you ever will. As we do that, Christ brings us his peace. I've prayed all week, if that happens to be you, that God would move in that way in your life. Let's move on to verse 15. Verse 15 says this. I read this earlier, but I'll read it again. It says, When the angel of the Lord went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and a baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, as it had just been told to them. So the angels, they leave the shepherds, and the shepherds head into town to investigate what they were just told about, right? And they find things to be exactly as the angel told them it was going to be. I mean, can you imagine that? The prophecy they just heard out in the fields is true. The Messiah has come. When something amazing happens, you, of course, you've got to tell somebody about it, right? And that's what the shepherd did right there in verse 17. And then we move to 18, and we have this really curious statement. It says that all who heard what the shepherd said, they wondered, Right? Could these lowly shepherds be right? I mean, think about the story. You've heard this story, many of you, for many, many years. Joseph and Mary weren't running around bragging up that they had won the baby lottery, right? Like, they hit the jackpot. We got baby Jesus. But they weren't running around telling people that they won the baby baby lottery, right? And, And it's highly likely that Joseph and Mary are staying with some of Joseph's extended relatives. And these guys come rolling in with this news? What are we to make of it? I mean, have these guys lost their mind? They're shepherds. Why in the world would God entrust this message with them? I mean, would God really come to earth like this? Humbly? Wonder is one of those really unique words in the English language as we translate this from the Greek to the English. 
Wonder, of course, has a lot of positive connotations, right? Wonder means usually something very positive. You marvel at something. You've seen something miraculous. You're amazed, right? That's the stuff that causes wonder. But to wonder also can include feelings of doubt and uncertainty, right? That word has a dual meaning. And here these guys who are listening to these shepherds are kind of stuck in that in-between. The shepherds are telling us God has come to them. But look at Mary's response in verse 19. It says, Mary treasures up what they said concerning Jesus. Mary has no doubt. The, angels had already, the angel had already come to her and Joseph and spoken to her. There was no doubt left into her mind. She believed what the shepherds were saying was true because she knew in her heart it was. Mary's role in this story is so much about her faithfulness, so much about her trust in God. And this little passage here just adds to it. Then in verse 20, we have this just great line. I love this line. It says, And the shepherds returned, glorifying, And praising God for all that they had seen and heard, as it had been told to them. These guys are out of place in town. Right? They don't fit in. They're probably a bit sleep deprived at this point. They just walked in from the fields, wherever their sheep were. The angel was keeping them up late at night. They're tired. They're worn out. They're rough around the edges. And now they're walking back to the fields where they came from. The same old fields, same old work. But you know what isn't the same? The shepherds. The shepherds aren't the same. You know why? Because the shepherds had met Jesus. You can't meet Jesus and not be transformed. They go back to work not quietly, not trying to avoid making a scene, not trying to kind of, you know, slink off. These are the kind of guys who normally didn't want unwanted attention. No, they leave glorifying God, praising God for all that they had seen and heard. And that's how we are supposed to respond. We come to worship. We come to celebrate. We come to be restored and to find our peace. We come and we meet Jesus. And we should leave like the shepherds left, praising and glorifying. I know for some at this time of year, it it can be a rough time of year. We can feel lonely. We can feel left behind. We can feel lost. We can feel inadequate. We can feel like like we just don't have what it takes to measure up. And if we're not careful, that can steal our joy, our hope, our peace. Kick those thoughts to the curb, folks. Jesus came to ensure that we would never be alone. Jesus came to bring us peace. To bring us, in the Hebrew, shalom. Jesus came to open the door for us to his peace, his shalom, to his great, magnificent glory and love. A peace that surpasses all understanding if we will just put our hope and trust in it. See, I love Christmas services for this reason. That we get to come together as a greater family, a group of believers, as those who make up the kingdom of God and just rejoice. Rejoice that the God of our salvation, that Jesus has come, has come as a baby in the manger, representing peace, and that peace has been established, and that one day that peace will reign forever. As you leave today, leave as the shepherds left. Leave transformed by coming into contact with Jesus. As you go forth into the world, go rejoicing, go celebrating, go proclaiming what you have seen and what you have heard. And go forth with the peace that only God can bring. Amen. Let's pray.